Welcome to Wagon Wheel. I am Jared Kimber. Here we are again for another episode where we talk about uh, things that you've asked me, really. If you asked me the questions on Patreon beforehand, which you can sign up on our Patreon page, it means your question is guaranteed. Um, if not, you can put your question in the chat. And if you do a super chat, it's also guaranteed, unless I miss it or you do it really late, which, you know, is on you, really, not on me. Uh, some really interesting questions from what I've seen already coming into the chat. Um, and let us start with the Patreon ones. Renee said, did the women's IPL miss a trick by not restricting the bids of teams to just the IPL owners and also allowing an IPL owner to bid for a different city than the original IPL team? Uh, thankfully, that didn't happen. Um, I'm not sure that would have happened, although that's interesting. Uh, your first question, no, I don't think so. Uh, well, it's, that's an interesting one. I like the idea of getting more ownership groups. I was going to say, like, you know, wet, wet their tongues, wet their whistles, dip their toe in. I'm struggling for the right analogy. So from that perspective, no, I don't have a problem from it. I, I do think from a branding perspective, a management perspective and everything else, it's going to be really tough for these teams to start up in a couple of months. Although I suppose we're going to see a similar thing with Major League Cricket and something that happens a lot in t20 cricket so maybe we should be used to it by now um and that would have been a lot easier if you had a pre-existing team in, in in place um i'll probably put some feelers out to some of the women's teams shortly um just see how they feel uh, about you know the tight frame and everything else um but no i i like the idea that there's more owners involved in that now than there was before Manon says the referee the referees just elected Steph Curry for throwing his uh, ejected. No, they did not elect him. Throwing his mouthpiece uh, with a minute left and two points up, and a lot of the NBA media seems to think that referees made a mistake. What are your thoughts on this? And has something like this happened in international cricket? Well, we don't have um, players being thrown off the field, although I suppose you could argue that we should have have players thrown off the field at times before. Um, I suppose in COVID times, taking something out of your mouth and throwing it into a public space is probably a bit stupid. I didn't see the incident, so, um, you know, and also the Warriors are playing like trash anyway, so <laughs> it may not, may not matter in, in the end of things. Um, I'm trying to think of cricket. Um, I've seen it happen in club cricket. I remember an umpire refusing to have a, a player on the field uh, with them um and having them moved um i'm trying to think if i've seen anything else that dramatic ever happen before um but yeah i that i think there have been talks about sin bins yellow cards red cards whatever you want to call it um ejections um those sorts of things in cricket before i would say that cricket players are fairly respectful i can't think of too many times I, i've seen certainly players lose their temper with umpires but for whatever reason, it's probably a different kind of sport than football and, and basketball and those sorts of sports. And it just, it maybe doesn't go to the level. The interesting one that I saw the other day, um, I it must be from the Australian Open. You know, I, I saw it pop up on TikTok or YouTube shorts or wherever I was. Um, it, you know, I'd forgotten the way that tennis players still talk to umpires. That was a really interesting one to me. But I would say overall, players are pretty respectful when it comes to umpires. What's one of the worst ones? Uh, Colin Croft. Um, was it Colin Croft? Running through the umpire. Famously runs right on the crease. Colin Croft suddenly went through the umpire with an elbow. That was pretty bad. Um, I reckon there's probably been a few umpires in the, in, in the past that have had throws come closer to them or towards them at times. I'm probably missing something obvious. Um, as far as, you know, Play when players probably should have been ejected from games. Probably, you know, the Marlon Samuels, Shane Warne incident is an obvious one, is one, although James Sutherland seemed to like that that happened. Um, but yeah, I don't think we have that big of a problem with it in cricket. So I'm not sure we need any changes um, in the rules uh, or anything to worry about it at the moment. But I also think that I, I'm sure the MCC and the ICC have looked at things like yellow card. Well, of recent times, I should say, I've looked at things like yellow cards and red cards and sin bin and everything else. And I think going into the future, it might be something that we'll see in cricket. Patrick says, if you would have developed a cricket fielding statistic where, without using any form of tracking, 
what metrics would you incorporate? I, I mean, I would probably only do one with tracking. The, the, the versions that I have come up with before are very similar to what CrickViz does, uh, which is more like an errors model. So from the old baseball style, it's fine, but it doesn't account for a lot of things. Also, mo uh, CrickViz is, I think, is done from the TV. You can't actually see the angles with which the, the fielders are running to the balls or how far away the ball was to the, the fielder when it was hit. Um, I think the only way to do a proper fielding metric is that way. But I would love it if, I don't know, a company like Opta uh, might be the or, uh, might be the best one, or even Crickviz made it public for whatever reason. Um, even just the fielding errors would would give us an idea. But when I've looked at fielding error data, yeah, and, and I've looked at Crickviz's data before. It, it's the best way to put it is it's better than nothing, but it's a long way away from what you could do quite simply um, with one camera at the ground. Bloody Bugger says, any interesting pieces of investigative journalism cricket you would recommend reading? Uh, pieces can be as old as you want. There's a really good, and I've forgotten the name, there's a really good piece on Basil Dolavira that I want to say came out in The Night Watchman, and it was going back through the old um, transcripts of the committee meetings and everything. Um, uh, it was really interesting, um, in, you know, into and, you know, Peter O'Born's written about that and um, other people. And, he, you know, he's done some very good stuff. But I would say that was one of the most interesting. Ed Hawkins' book on match fixing is a very interesting uh, read from someone who's worked in the gambling industry quite a lot in cricket. Um, Death of a Gentleman's probably, you know, um, one, of the, one of the more famous ones. Uh, you know, the big three leak came um, from one of the cricket boards just sending out copies of the of the committee report, <laughs> if we're being honest. Um, I won't say who the board was, but it's quite funny that that happened. Um, yeah, so you talk about, for example, when I talked about the boards came together and agreed to make pitches more spicy. I think that's been debunked probably by me um, since then. There doesn't, there isn't a really big, uh, there isn't a really big market for selling news stories about cricket. And so if you're an investigative journalist, it's a bit tricky. The ones that I've heard about are looking into some of the chairman's uh, dealings with each other. Um, and nothing has ever come of that. But, you know, business deals where like two chairmen, like one board did something for the other board and then that chairman got a deal from there. There's also some, there's certainly been some allegations privately of, um, uh, there's certainly been allegations privately of chairman taking less money from sponsors but getting a kickback directly themselves um what else what's the other one and the other major one is you know what how many of these leagues are being run for either money laundering or sports washing or for betting rights deals or whatever but when you go to publications with that it's very rare. In fact, I know of a major publication looking at a big story at the moment. Um, and there's not a lot of money uh, that's been sent on it. The Al Jazeera documentary uh, probably came out what, a few years after uh, Death of a Gentleman about match fixing. It's a, you know, I've been through that film a couple of times. I've talked to some of the people involved with it. They did some good work and obviously they did break some incredible stories, but they're bigger uh, um a narrative maybe not quite there so um from that perspective those are the ones that come off the top of my head uh, if you to understand the, the model when i had the royal pindy story so someone tells me that pcb are going to you know contest this pitch i'm like great and i tried to sell it to a bunch of places and no one wanted it it's like that's definitely a news story it, sometimes it's really hard to sell that and when you do sell it you sell it for not very much money investigative journalism takes money and time and diligence G generally what happens also is it's people from outside the sport if you look at death of a gentleman you know me and um sam were on the fringes of cricket if we were any more in the game it would have been really hard and it, it was hard anyway you know the ecb took my press accreditation away the icc said they were going to take my press accreditation away um you know other issues with other boards because of that film um it's really, really hard to do it when you're a cricket journalist. And most sports investigative journalism is done outside. But there's no, like Cricket Info don't have the ESPN investigative side part of their, you know, I don't think they've done any cricket. Um, the I, I, remember, I remember when we did the film, 
um, and the Guardian and the Daily Mail were like, oh, we should have done this, but it would have cost too much money. And we're like, well, actually, it wouldn't have cost too much money to get break the stories, <laughs> to tell the whole story. It wouldn't cost that much money at all. But like to them, it was more than a few thousand dollars. So that was too much money for, the, for what they thought it was worth. So it is really, really tough. Uh, Gary says, in the last show, you mentioned differences in how crowds from different nations support their teams. I'm wondering what are your observations? So, so England sort of sets a pattern of what an, a cricket observer is, which is probably a little bit more even handed, um, a little bit more celebrating what the opposition do. Not, not all the grounds. And you're certainly seeing through Headingley, maybe edge bust and less of that now, um, as they're becoming more normal home, home fans. Um, Australia is very much like a football crowd, probably not a soccer crowd, but more like an Aussie rules or a rugby league crowd. Um, and you really notice that there. Um, South Africa, you get, South Africa doesn't have the people or the intensity of um, Australian cricket, but it does have a lot of the very, very like verbal things. So we've seen a lot of great, you know, Merv Hughes and Ben Stokes, Shane Warne, um, there's another player as well I'm missing off that list, you know, being really heavily abused by South African fans. Uh, um, then you've got Asian fans, which is this, they're not all the same, but it's a similar kind of, there's a real buzz about Asian crowds that you don't get as much in uh, the Western crowds and everyone else. And then you've got the West Indies who are probably the most, they're probably like South, a bit like South Africa, but more intense in their, you know, abusive players, playing with play, players, banter, very much like one-on-one, -on -one, like one famous person or one loud person being involved with it, trying to stir up conversations. South Australia has that, but in Australia, it very quickly becomes a whole section of the crowd. Whereas in my experience in, in um, West Indies and in South Africa, it's like that one person becomes the proxy for the crowd and you have this sort of back and forth conversation where everyone's kind of listening, but it's one player and, and um, uh, one member of the crowd. Uh, and India is, yeah, just that intensity um, of, of uh, uh, you know, of the crowds there. Um, I, you know, I liken, especially India games and IPL games, but I've seen this with big Sri Lankan games as well, you know, almost like a mega church feel to it. Whereas, you know, if you look at England and perhaps places like New Zealand, it's a little bit more like, you know, a Presbyterian, um, you know, a village church in comparison. I hope that helps. Uh, Aditya says, uh, how do you see the pricing of the women's IPL franchise? I saw it as fantastic. Uh, also, what do you make of the BCCI allowing five foreign players, including the associate player in the, in the 11? So the pricing I thought was absolutely incredible. Again, proves <laughs> it's hilarious how many times we have to prove that, you know, women's cricket or women's sport can make money, um, that people are willing to pay money for it. Uh, incredible on the back of the TV rights and this. I, I think... I think a lot, I, if it was me and I was, you know, uh, talking to a company, I would have gone in with a $150 million bid and I would have got a team for that too. Um, I think it was silly um, that some of them thought it, they were going to be able to get them cheaper. And I think $150 million bid, I think in 10 years time, you'd be laughing at that investment in a women's IPL team. Um, so I think uh, all the teams, everyone who got teams, I thought should be in a very good position. It might, it might be the situation where it's been slightly oversold at the moment. Um, you know, there seems to be a lot of hype and buzz around it. My guess is when you factor in all the women's brands, the sporting brands, um, all the different products that you could sell um, available to you, and then it will get fairly decent ratings. I think they we should make a profit very, very early on in a way that the men's teams did not. Um, and I think it's just a brilliant investment going ahead. Uh, the five overseas players, I mean, that come, I love the associate player rule. But the five overseas players is because they don't think that Indian and women's cricket is strong enough. I think that's the simple point on that. Love that they brought the associate player in. I, I've talked about this before. I interviewed, you know, for the general manager of the IPL, um, uh, I don't know, five years ago now. Um, and that was something I wanted the men's um, league uh, to bring in. It's from a PR perspective, from a marketing perspective, from a social media perspective, it's all really good. It's also good from a cricket perspective. So I, I think there's a lot of winners to that. Doing it for the women's game, I think is a brilliant idea. I I know the BBL had flirted with it before. And obviously the 100 have Irish and Scottish players um, involved um, in, in their league. But I just think this is, it's, 
it's a brilliant, brilliant concept. And I, I'm trying to think if I've had conversations. I think Major League Cricket might be thinking about it as well. It, it really is a really solid way um, of doing things. And because Associate Cricket's so good now, um, I think it's this is the time to do it, right? Madden says the most expensive uh, WPL team was sold for 100, over $150 million. Um, uh, oh, sorry, the five teams were sold for more than the eight initial IDI. Does it mean IPL? I'm a bit confused. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a lot of money. Um, but I think sport is worth a lot more money now. And also, we know what this is. Um, if you're comparing, If you're comparing it to... Um, you know, Major League Cricket, they got $150 million in, in financing. I'm assuming that probably by the time they start and all the owners are involved, it's probably going to be two, 220 million, it's just a guess. Um, and they don't even have a league and we don't know how many Americans are going to go turn up. I think we know in India that the IPL will be around in 10 years time, which means that the women's IPL will most probably be around in 10 years time. We've already seen the, the TV rights deal. I, I just think it's, Solid, solid play. Christopher says, do batters who have more eccentric techniques and trigger movements tend to have bigger falls at the end of their career because their hand-eye coordination starts to go and struggles to cope with so many moving parts? I've never heard anyone... I, I, well, I would say that's probably less of a thought in cricket. The bigger thought in cricket is that players who play across the line tend to have a bigger problem um, as the end of their career comes about. I'm not sure how true that is. I thought Kevin Peterson was very good at the end of his career. Um, I mean, you could say Sachin was still pretty good. I don't think I don't think they had comical drop offs, and I would say both of those players who probably played um, a little bit more across the line. Kevin Peterson a lot, Sachin a little bit less. Uh, Graham Smith, I'd, I'd have to go back and check his numbers. Um, but again, another player who played across the line. It's something that is said a lot in cricket. I mean, the best current one would be Steve Smith, who. Everyone is expecting this big savage drop off, and he certainly had a go slow period, but it didn't appear to be because he was playing across the line. It actually weirdly was with the balls, you know, back of a length outside of stump that seemed to be the bigger problem. And then the next part of that is that, um, uh, you know, you then have he's now in better form than he was in, you know, well, maybe not better form, but in the sort of film he was in a couple of years ago. But the, the general thought is that that is the case. I, I still think the bowlers are worried about um, – you'd have to – it'd have to be so bad and so dramatic um, that I would have thought we would have noticed it. But Viv Richards is another one that we didn't notice it with. It feels to me like it's maybe one of those – it's not a myth, and I'm sure it plays a part, but there are so many little things in your batting that as you get older, probably you can't do anymore. I would have thought one of the more important ones is the inability to sway away from short balls. So what happens for people who've batted a lot in their life is their backs get very stiff. And at, it's, you know, just any sort of inflexibility against a short ball means you can't get away from it. So it's not as if you're not, you might still be picking it up at the same speed, but your body can't shift and away from it. And so you see maybe older batters sometimes getting caught down the leg side a little bit more. You see the older batters getting hit, maybe gloving into the offside a little bit more. Um, or you see them getting hit and then getting rattled in, in their innings. And um, that, to me, is probably undersold, whereas what you're talking about, Christopher, is maybe oversold. But I've never seen the data. I, you, would have to, you would have to map the trajectory of a bat and then, um, and then map that with Hawkeye um, over a long period of time um, to be able to put that together. But of the, of the very top players who play across the line, they tend to be able to play across the line their entire life, from what I can tell. Will, is it easy to improve the average of a fast-growing player um, or increase the strike rate of a slower player who already is a higher average? That's a really good question. I think I think I lean more towards the fact that if you can attack, you can be trained in which balls to attack and when in an easier way than if you're natural inclination, if you don't have power or you don't have freedom within your batting. I think that is a very hard thing to suddenly manufacture later in your career. Whereas I think it would be, I think if you can work with Andre Russell um, or, you know, a player, a player like that, you can at least say to them, these are the balls we want you to attack. 
and these are the balls that you can knock for singles, um, then you should be able to get their average up more than than someone else. The question is, do you, and, and, and that hasn't happened that often, but the question is, do you want that to happen, right? Because you really, I mean, Andre Russell was incredible because he averaged 30 for, you know, a good period of his career, but even averaging 25, the damage that he does to opposition game plans um, and the, you know, the inability for teams to plan for him correctly is really, really uh, quite scary, I suppose, to teams. Um, and so because of that, you know, I remember talking to a IPL team during the, the peak of his powers and they were like asking what to do. And I was saying, sure, surely you just bring your leg spinner on to start with. Um, uh, no matter what he's on. And and they were talking about the fact that um, does that mean they hold their leg spinner back, which meant they had to change their plan. And it's a fair thing. And so when you can do that, it's very hard to game plan for someone like that. And you only need a small jump in their average for them to be incredibly da damaging, right? You don't need them to jump that much. Because I think for a player who's striking with a slow strike rate, you probably need a real ramp up. And, and I... We've seen Sean Massoud do it, so it's not impossible to do, but I do think you need to be – I would have thought it would be harder to coach, but it'd be interesting what batting coaches think on that. Uh, Rene says, should Western journalists be a little bit more sensitive when asking for – when asking for India, Pakistan cricket, or Pakistan players in the IPL? We know politics can be separated – can't be separated from sport, as with Russian athletes and teams being banned everywhere. Should Western be a little bit more sensitive when asking? Um, no, um, I don't think so. Um, there are politics involved. Uh, there are politicians involved with the BCCI. There are basically was a politician involved with the PCB. I suppose there still is. Um, so politics are very much in, uh, aligned with those two places. Pakistan and India play each other. I, I mean, I'm not really sure what the I, what the main core of your question is. But I think these are fair questions. I mean, Pakistan players in the IPL is almost never brought up. So what sensi sensitivity are we talking about there? India, Pakistan, cricket. I don't I haven't read too many articles about people. So I, I'm not really sure what the, the thinking behind this question is, Renee. Um, I think that it is, if you're going to talk about it, you have to be aware that, you know, you're going to have a bunch of bucks suddenly attacking you on Twitter. Um, we've all been there. Um, and all that sort of all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and sometimes from the Pakistan side as well. Um, but the truth is that, you know, they have played against each other. They play against each other at World Cup. So they clearly don't have that big of a deal about it, which is what that's what I would say. Um, 2016, Pakistan played India in India. In, I would say that was a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and so it's it's a little bit really you know ridiculous that it's been allowed to get to the position it has but you know no one's in charge of cricket as i've said before so that ain't changing all right let's have a brief break and after the break i'll finish off the patreon and then i'll get to your questions you're listening to cricket's conversation on 99.94 Whatever your team, we have the show for you on podcast, YouTube, or on the 99.94 app. We have India, England, South Africa, West Indies, and now Sri Lanka covered. If you want to find us, the best way is to follow us on social media at 9994DM by downloading the 9994 app or Google 99.94 on podcast. We speak cricket. All right, then. Oh, I've lost my questions. Here they are. And Manon, oh, I've already done that one. Manon says, do you think cricket players need a union? Yes, they have a union. Uh, uh, Federation of International Cricket Association. Cricketers Association. I should know that. Um, South Africa, West Indies, New Zealand, Australia, England. I think that's it. I think those are the player unions. Is Sri Lanka involved? Don't think so. Um, look, I think uh, I'm not an expert in you know union culture in 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 the subcontinent, but you know 
union culture was obviously quite big in Australia and that's where it was formed. It was actually formed in Australia kind of twice, once under Ian Chappell, then later under Tim May. Um, it then became a very big thing, you know, um, throughout those other Western sort of countries. Obviously, West Indies have gone on strike twice. So the players' union, uh, well, actually, in one case, they went on strike against the players' union, but that's a whole other messy story for another time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, realistically, the IPL players are massively underpaid, right? If they were unionized, that would not happen. Um, uh, I, I think that since the ICL, the BCCI has been pretty clever, you know, the player um, playing the domestic players. Someone said to me on Twitter the other day, that's an investment in cricketers. I'm like, no, it's a wage. <laughs> it's not an investment in cricketers. They, before they were playing because they wanted to, and now they're playing because it's their job, which is how these things should work if your governing organization is making billions of dollars. Um, so, so from that perspective, um, I certainly believe that uh, it would be better right across the board. I think there's a lot of issues in cricket when it comes to T20 payments that could be fixed if the players union had more power, but they can't have more power because, you know, Pakistan and India specifically, but also, you know, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, or maybe it's Bangladesh that's involved, it, whoever, the missing teams make a big deal. If all the top teams were involved, it would certainly make a big uh, big deal. And, and to talk about, you know, some of the good things that player unions have done, um, you know, o over time, you know, getting that, uh, uh, shoring up the player image rights in the West Indies, where the West Indian players were getting underpaid, um, the Australian men uh, getting extra money for the Australian women um, was a big thing. Even though Cricket Australia was trying to drive a wedge between the two of them. Uh, so, the, you know, I think the same with New Zealand. The Players Union, I think, played a big part there. It, uh, the New Zealand uh, representative is... Um, Oh my God, uh, the former fast bowler um, from New Zealand, his brother, Heath Mills. So Kyle Mills, his brother, runs that. Um, there's a South Australian cricketer runs Fika and um, I think it might be a former Worcester cricketer who runs uh, the PCA in England. Uh, PCA, which is, um, yeah, uh, um, does a lot of great work for um, former players who go through hardships and everything else. So there is a players union there. I certainly think it needs to be a lot stronger. It would be great if everyone was involved in it. It would certainly help players get paid better. They get, you know, uh, better um, uh, support, especially those who play in T20 leagues because the players union is kind of hamstrung by the T20 league um, at the moment and they don't have enough power. And that's where players are getting ripped off the most. Um, uh, uh, and so a union would be huge for that. Ian says, love to chat with Adam Crossway. That's up on Red Inca today, if you want to go listen to it. And I, uh, so Adam Crossway was a Victorian wicketkeeper who then coached the Sydney Thunderbolt, Sydney, Seattle Thunderbolts uh, in the minor league trophy, and they won that. Um, and we're talking about American cricket and everything else. Um, I see that the whole tournament is being staged at one venue near Dallas. Do you know how they came to that decision? Is Dallas a relatively speaking cricket hotbed? So Morrisville is probably still the biggest hotbed. And that's to do with the three universities around Morrisville that that I believe have, I'm assuming, a lot of Indians, but maybe perhaps a lot of Pakistani and Bangladesh and Sri Lankans as well. But I, I know there's certainly Indians in that area. Um, uh, the other major hotbeds, I suppose, would be, I would have thought Houston more than Dallas, but there was a baseball stadium in Dallas that was relatively cheap, is, is mine, uh, Wild Hogs, Flying Hogs. Hog Hogs uh, baseball stadium, which is, I think was a minor league stadium. They had the ability to, to, to buy that up. There are obviously stories and rumors about them buying other more major grounds. San Francisco would have been another very interesting one. Seattle would have been another very interesting one. Um, and then of course you've got the New York cricket scene and, and Philadelphia cricket scene. But my guess is they wanted to put it all in one place so they could bring everyone together and make it easy in that first year. And that they had one major stadium, um, but going ahead, yeah, it will be in the others. But I, I, I I think Dallas has cricket, but I'm not sure you'd say it's like, you know, in the top couple of, you know, most excitable uh, cricket places. But I think that um, all things considered, it might have been their best option for this particular tournament is, is what I'm hearing. Satchmo says, did the West Indies bowl so much short stuff in the 80s that their test became unattractive? I don't think they bowled as much short stuff. If you go back and watch, they certainly had periods where they bowled quite, short but really what they did was they bowled back of a length more than short um the problem with what the west indies did was it was unattractive in some ways but not from 
the short bowling as much as that they were bowling like what 65 70 overs a day because that was the only way to bowl with four fast bowlers <laughs> um and that did become unattractive and that was a major problem within cricket um you know people taking six seven minutes uh eight minutes to bowl their overs anyone who's ever watched the shannon gabriel spell uh, imagine four shannon gabriels and you sort of understand where the west indies were going at times that was a problem uh there was there was certainly if you read the english press it was it wasn't always given it was talked about in a negative way a lot i think some of that was just racism um and there's certainly a lot of you know some of the old articles come i can always get the two of them confu confused but either in the cricketer or the wisdom cricketer whatever they whichever one was which at that stage um they've changed names so many times i'm confused and i've worked for both of them i think um uh, but when those when those magazines existed um when there were two of them before they became one um you read some of the articles and it was really negative the reporting on it a lot of it was talking about the overrate but some of it was talking about how boring it was um but a lot of it was as i said that there's a lot of racial um bias in some of those articles as well um if you i mean if you look at the difference between the way that tomo and lily were covered and the way that the west indians were covered it would be hard to say that there wasn't a bias there even if you know uh, Tom and Lily was only two people. They certainly bombed teams, um, at, you know, with their pace. Um, but yeah, I, I think also some of those West Indian pitches, you go back and you have a look at them and they were, there were some really exciting pitches, but some really dull pitches as well. So if you've got four fast bowlers bowling back, even if they're not bowling short balls, but they're bowling back at length over after over after over, and they're not bowling many overs and no one's really scoring against them. There was certainly some very attritional cricket played, uh, you know, against the West Indies. I think part of the way that you had to beat the West Indies was physically outlast them. That's not baseball, right? Um, you know, it is a little bit different. And I think the the exciting moments, of course, are when you know Holding or Ambrose or Garner is running through a team, and then Viv Richards and Greenwich get going. But you look at some of their batters, and some of their batters are a lot more attritional than that as well. It's so it's not quite. Sometimes it's oversold as attacking. Um, whereas maybe those are some of the great moments, but my memories of even watching them in, you know, uh, in the early nineties, there was some really attritional cricket played by the West Indies. Um, and, and you might still have had Richie Richardson, Lara and Ambrose and, and Walsh and those sorts of players They had a lot of grinders out there and a lot of guys who were just hitting back of a length, um, over and over again, but highly skilled. So, you know, it was depending on what you want to get out of the cricket, it might've been slightly, it, it was either entertaining or not. I don't think there's a, there was not a definitive view that they were terrible to watch, but there's certainly not a definitive view that they were always great to watch either. So if there's any thoughts on England, New Zealand, uh, I think it's a really interesting series. I'm covering it for TalkSport. I haven't quite got my head around um, it yet, uh, but I'll be commentating over at TalkSport for that. Um, what I find really interesting is that over the last few years, New Zealand have been putting out fairly green pitches that I don't think quite do as much as they look like they're going to do. But other teams have really struggled against New Zealand's attacks on them. That means that there is sideways movement. How will England go if that is the case? But the other side of this is just this is not as good a New Zealand team. I think it has they have slipped back. The players that they've lost, you know, they haven't been able to replace BJ Watling. I'm not sure they've really replaced um, Ross Taylor. Uh, you know, obviously, we don't know what bowlers uh, will play or are fit, and all those sorts of situ all that sort of situation for them. I, I, it's a fascinating series. Um, I, I really looking forward to it. Um, it. Feels like there's about nine series starting before then, so it's a really busy period of cricket. Thomas says uh, the International League T20. Oh, still struggling to get my head around that. Is not a sanctioned T20 tournament, but it's getting all the kudos and coverage that one would expect. At what point Bar plays records the fact it's not sanctioned ceased to matter? I don't think it ever mattered. <laughs> um, it, yeah. Um, a Kerry Packer series wasn't sanctioned. Um, we've certainly had, you know, series before that have done this. I don't think that really matters. It comes down to quality of cricket, which players are playing, uh, the time of the year it's on, the time zone, everything else people are going to watch or not. What percentage of people would you think have watched that, understand that that's no, not going on the players' um you know, T20 records, <laughs> probably very few. The, the other thing I would say is this whole thing about official records, like the ICC don't keep official records, <laughs> right? So I'm not even sure why it would matter to anyone. It's such a bizarre thing. Um, 
uh, and I'm sure if you, t I mean, I'd be really interesting to talk to the, um, the scorers and statistician, no, the, is that what it's called? The scorers and statistician association, the ACS, I, I should know that, uh, I've got the, the initials, but if I talk to them, it'd be really interesting to see what their members thought, because they're more important than what the ICC think. James says, how do you distinguish fast from fast, medium, medium, fast, and medium? Is it purely speed or bowler's technical and tactical approach? By part? No, it's purely speed. I mean, it's completely subjective. Um, so it's, you know, purely speed. It's really how fast it seems. Uh, who would you say was the last successful medium pacer in test cricket? Alderman. No, no, definitely uh, not Alderman. Um, yeah, it's very subjective. It's probably, when I was at Cricket Info, one of the biggest complaints that players ever had about their profiles was uh, if they were a bowler, how they were described. Um, so it is a big deal. I remember a player who plays agent calling up kind of, I wouldn't say in tears, but so frustrated that someone at Cricket Info had decided they were medium fast, not fast medium, and that they weren't getting a contract and they were blaming that. So it's a big deal, but it's, as I said, it's fairly subjective. Um, uh, Last specialist, medium pacer. So I would say that medium pace has changed. I mean, in the in the seventies and eighties, you're probably bowling at 70, 75 miles an hour to be a medium pacer. Because I think now you're bowling 75 to you know 82, 83 is probably medium pace. So Muhammad Abbas would probably be the last successful medium pacer um, by that. You could also have a look at Colin de Grandhomme. I'm not sure what his paces were, but certainly he would I would have thought he would have uh, been medium pace. But it really does depend because I would say really anything, anyone who is consistently above 90 should be considered fast. I would think that high 80s is fast medium and sort of low to mid 80s is medium fast. Um, but I'm sure there are other people that would probably stretch that out a little bit further. But being the medium pace, no one no one really bowls lower than slower than 75 miles an hour anymore unless they're like, I don't know, even Daryl Mitchell probably bowls faster than that, right? So they are, I mean, Dar someone like Daryl Mitchell or Colin de Grandhomme, uh, certainly medium paces, um, if you look at what modern cricket is. So I would stretch it out a little bit. But if, if you're saying someone probably, yeah, if we, let's make it really official, if, well, not official, but <laughs> let's make it a little bit more finite. 90 to 95 is probably fast. 85 to 90 is probably fast medium. Uh, 80 to 85 is probably medium fast. And then 75 to 80 is um medium pace so tim murta um muhammad abbas muhammad asif jason holder might be there too he might be medium fast um kyle mayers um, i'm trying to think of people who are super successful i mean tim Southey wasn't that far. i suppose he's a bit quicker than that though isn't he um he's probably medium fast he's probably been called fast medium but probably is medium fast um those are the ones off the top of my head anyway um but yeah so i think you have to adjust that there are still medium paces it's just that medium pace is different what you don't have is paul collingwood sir of ganguly jonathan trot juno ronatunga graham gooch ricky ponting type bowlers anymore steve war um and, and that's partly because batters don't bowl as much anymore and those are more the sort of medium paces we had so we, we didn't we never even had that many aldermans right but we did have a lot of other guys around you know your you know, mark butcher type bowlers butch is going to be upset at being medium pace anyway don't tell him on twitter sandeep says is the icc right in rescinding the demerit points for the royal pindy pitch quoting mitigating factors like this 37 wickets during the course of the match they're not right in quoting 37 wickets absolutely nonsense that they've quoted that um they are right <laughs> I think they made a mistake with the original Royal Pindy pitch where they uh, where they said it was uh, below average when I think it was far worse than that when Australia played there. That should have been given a heavier sanction, which would have allowed for this to get a lighter sanction, which I think would have been fine. Um, but they don't have a proper system in place and they were basically exposed by the PCB for that. So from that perspective, I don't have any problem with the, what the PCB did, but I have huge problems with the ICC not having a proper system when it comes to pitches. As I've said before, we have the data. Depending on where you're from, we have the data. We have numbers. We have 800,000 test balls all around the world to tell us what is a good pitch and what is a bad pitch. 
I didn't go through the, you know, Crickfizz's algorithms to have a look at where that pitch came out. That's a far better system than, than Andy Pycroft going, oh, England made 500 on day one, so it's a bad pitch. And then the ICC going, well, there were 37 wickets taken, so it must be a good pitch. What? That, that's not how you judge the pitch. You judge the pitch by what the ball does when it bounces off it. Idiots. Anyway, uh, let's have another break. And then after the break, I will get to the comments on YouTube. Uh, and also, remember, you can follow us on uh, Facebook, um, Twitter. You know, uh, maybe your mum's watching on WhatsApp. I don't know. If you love the language of cricket and want more, then head over to the 99.94 app and you can hear all of our podcasts and cricket commentary. We're adding new shows all the time and covering cricket series from all over the world. Be the first to hear all of our announcements by following us on social media at 9994DM. Welcome to Cricket's Conversation. All right. So let's get to YouTube chats. Uh, oh, my God. I completely pressed the wrong button. Stuffed up my entire life here. Let's get rid of Sandeep's question. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you to everyone on Patreon. Uh, and let us get over to the comments. So first, Super Chat. He says, optimistically, and now he's lost it. Here we go. AB Sam. AB Sam says, what do you think of Shulman Gill and his potential to be the next big thing in um, Indian cricket and, and hair to Coley's throne? I'm not interested in whether he's going to be, you know, the next Coley because that's it's kind of a ridiculous comparison. Like, uh, as in, that's not what his job is. His job is to be the best Shulman Bill he can be. Uh, Shulman Bill? Uh, Shulman Gill he can be. Um, I think he's a different kind of player, the Coley, different kind of personality, the Coley. Um, I wouldn't even worry about that. I, I think he's very sound technically. Um, I'd have to, I, I'm more interested in how that game translates overseas. I certainly understand how it should make sense in India, but a bit like Shreya Sai, who I also think is a really good player. It's that next step now. And, and that could be one of the mo more interesting things. India is producing incredible domestic batting talent you know, guys who can't get in the side. Um, we know that there's not a problem there when it comes to talent. What is India cricket going to do to be able to fast track some of these incredible players so that they can be successful in overseas conditions as quickly as possible? That, that for me, is is part of what I think about uh, with, with Shulman Gill so far. Um, so I'm just going to uh, quickly bring up his numbers here as well. But he... He, I like the way he stays on top of the ball. I feel like he's got the ability to hit bowlers off their length, uh, which I think in test cricket is really, really important. Um, obviously, in one-day cricket so far, he's got an inflated record, but it's only from a handful of games. Really, just what I want to see from him as, as much as possible is is how he goes in overseas conditions. I, I'm not sure. In, with Shreya Sire, I think there's, I think it's a real jump for him. I'm not sure with Shulman Gill if if it's going to be the same kind of thing, if we're going to have to see him change massively. But no, I, I mean, I certainly read him. I just want to have a look quickly at his record. So uh, Shulman Gill, so he made runs in Australia, didn't he? He made some runs in New Zealand in test matches. And I just want to check ODIs as well. Um, yeah, so so far, the signs there are really good, I would say. It, you, know, you know, you know, it's never a problem if you're, it's never a problem if you're way better at home than you are away. Problem is, is, you know, if you're averaging, like, was it Aiden Markram who averages 20 or 24 away from home? Um, even if you're someone like David Warner who can average high 30s away from home, that's still, if you look at the history of cricket, and well above average player. Um, so I don't think there's any p problems with that. And so should McGill, if he can average low 40s away from home, he would be a success. And I like... I like a lot of his batting and I certainly would be persevering with him. What is he? 23, 24 now. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of him as a player. All right. Who else we got here? Max says with Australia losing the group stages of the world cup and Finch no longer in the ODI setup, Wade retiring, Warner, poor BBL and world cup. I wouldn't worry too much about Warner because he's had that a lot of times before and then suddenly snaps back. But yeah, the other guys certainly will they look to English short and Hardy. I think Inglis is certainly someone. Um, Philippi is another one that they're interested in. And there's a third one whose name I've forgotten now. Um, and then you, Hardy is certainly someone that they're interested in. I haven't heard much about Short. 
I, I, he's a, my guess is, and this is not talking to anyone, but just knowing how Australian cricket works, my guess is they're going to think he's not quite good enough to be banking on. So that if, if they ever get to a point where, you know, there's a, he gives them an added flexibility in their lineup, he might be the, you know, 10th or 11th player in. I don't think he's ever going to be in that core top eight players. Um, just that based on on what he's been so far, although he, you know, last couple of years he was pretty good, and obviously he's been good again. Uh, Inglis they do back, um, and Hardy is it's obviously quite early on. I don't think they'll move to him um, straight away, but it, there's no doubt there's excitement there, and I've already heard that from people in 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 Australian cricket. Jay says, "Why do visiting leg spinners have such poor test record in India?" 14 visiting spinners have taken 15 or more wickets averaging below 30. And Benno is the only le leggy in that list. My belief is that the leg spinners who visit India um, are generally slightly slower. So uh, when you get, if you look at Shane Warne, he just didn't look quite quick enough to regularly bother people in India. And, and I don't know how, if this is, this is obviously speed off the pitch once the ball is being bowled. But if you compare when Shane Warne was bowling into Sri Lanka, when he was bowling in India, it seemed like in Sri Lanka, the ball was zipping off, right? And if you count Murali as a wrist spinner, which I suppose technically he is um, in the way that he actually imparted revs on the ball, um, if uh, he was another one who did very well in Sri Lanka. And so I would have thought that Sri Lanka gets more spin than India, but it crucially gets quicker spin than India. So Crickviz have shown that Sri Lankan pitches, I think, spin the most. Uh, uh, but it's the pace of the spin, which is more important there. And I wonder how many of the spinners have come in have not been particularly quick. Bowling that when you bowl leg spin, you're putting more revolutions on the ball than an off spinner. And also with an off spinner, they can get a lot of their pace just by having a fast arm action. Whereas in leg spin, you already have quite a fast arm action. The ball just doesn't come out very fast. Um, and so it should make so it makes sense then that if the ball is a little bit slower, that the as the ball comes off the pitch a little bit slower than those finger spinners might be more used. That is my guess. It's not, it's not a great answer, but if you look at the great, you know, the, the two great consistent leg spinners that India had, they were both quick in their period. All right. So Chandra Seiko was quick for his time and Oakland Blade was quick for his time. I don't think that's a mistake. And I think a lot of very good leg spinners when they've probably turned up in places like India, don't have that kind of speed. It's really hard to bowl leg spin quicker. What cool deep Yadav has done is really really interesting i don't think i've seen another wrist spinner put that much pace on and finger spinners i've seen it happen a lot wrist spinners it's not something i've seen that often jugal says if you had to make an educated guess which foreign player do you think will command the highest fee at the wipl auction can i just say just in the comments uh today we've had wipl and wpl i'm gonna to have to and i've seen it written down both by news organizations as two different things we're gonna to have to pick an abbreviation for this thing very very soon um i would have thought india doesn't produce a lot of wicket keepers so the wicket keepers around the world that are um, that can hit would certainly be worth more money uh, based on that. So, I mean, India's main team doesn't have a wicket keeper uh, who has a good strike rate off the top of my head. I think that's, and I'm pretty sure that's right. Mostly they're getting concussed a lot, but that's a different story. Um, so that's an interesting thing to check out, that we, uh, especially Alyssa Healy. Um, I would have thought, just trying to think if there's any other wicket keeper that's high up on that list. Um, but yeah, uh, she is one that is interesting. You've then got the um, uh, Ashley Gardner and Danny Wyatt. So Ashley Gardner is what probably more of a bowling all rounder, I suppose we would say, um, uh, but smashes, you know, smashes the ball um, uh, around. Sorry, Ashley Gardner's the bowling all rounder, and Danny White's the batting all rounder. But uh, Danny White, I'm just looking, uh, I had her numbers up here before. She's uh, last two years of international cricket. She's got a strike rate of 129, um, and you know, with potentially some part time bowling available to her, McGrath is probably the best striker of the ball um amelia kerr is going to be another interesting one it, it, it what i'm interested in is will they go for youth or which teams will go for youth and which teams will go for instant impact um especially with you know with women's cricket it's an, it's a new new field so we don't know um bowlers 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 um i'm trying to 
think. I suppose you'd be because you're going to have a few more players who are not quite at that top level with bowlers. Are you going to prioritize pace? Um, because you're going to have a few domestic players playing in that tournament. Um, so if that's the case, you know, um, I suppose some of the quicker bowlers are a chance. Megan Short, you know, uh, might be a little bit old, older. As I said, they might be going for, for that slightly younger um, uh, way of looking at things. Um, but yeah, I think those are the, those are the players um, that I would be looking at at the moment. I'm trying to think if there's any all-rounders. I mean, Elise Perry is quite old, isn't she? I do Ashley Gardner. Um, I don't think of anyone else. What I'm also interested in is people like Gabby Lewis um, and some of the players who showed some stuff in the fair break tournament. Uh, whether, you know, we might see a couple of the associate players go for good money as well. All right. William says, do you know how top level domestic cricket came to be played by counties and states rather than by clubs like other sports? What well, started before other sports? Um, and uh, it was played by districts at that point. And I would say it's, this is an English based thing. Um, and it come it comes out of the fact that you had you had different districts playing it. And 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 then once England did it, I would say the other places copied it. What I don't know is specifically how other sports went towards clubs. So if you look at, there were certainly big clubs within cricket that could have, you know, that could have been teams. So for instance, the gentlemen of Philadelphia, right? That's not, you know, that's not a Pennsylvania um, team. It was the gentlemen of Philadelphia. You also had the, um, the Toronto, yeah, Toronto team the New York team. So there's three in America off the top of my head. Um, but there were teams like that sort of scattered around cricket as well. So from that perspective, it would have made sense. But once the county system picks up in what early 1800s um, and you have Middlesex as a team and Surrey has a team and everyone else, it seems that cricket just falls into line with that thinking really, really early on. The interesting thing there is that that isn't what happens with other places. And I wonder why that is the case. But most other sports become more city-based and cricket seems to go away from that model um, uh, quite early on. So the, maybe the interesting thing that would be to see, I, I would assume cricket and football are the two best ones to look at. Cricket went one way and football went the other. And and cricket's a little bit ahead of football, but how did those two things happen? Um, I mean, I know a little bit about the Manchester teams, but I don't know how the entire you know football um, system worked. But also, if you want to get even more weird, as I said, so I talked about Philadelphia, New York, Toronto having good club teams. AC Milan, of course, was a cricket club. Um, and so in Italy, you have a cricket club in it, you know, uh, in, in Milan, uh, not not a state or whatever they have in in, in Italy. Um, so it's kind of the whole thing's a bit weird. Um, but it's definitely it was definitely the county teams. Uh, sorry, it was definitely England cricket that brought in the county teams, and that seems to have gone to everyone else. But I don't know how the split to football happened um, specifically. My guess is it was just because they were all organised differently, um, uh, and uh, cricket then has. So cricket becomes county-based sort of in the early 1800s, but there are still random other teams. And then by the mid-1800s, there's obviously those kind of franchise teams, the All England 11 and the United England 11 or the England United 11 or whatever they were. Um, and even then, they're not particularly location-based. They are um, like wandering teams. So again, cricket, it seems to be very different to the way that um, other sports were um uh, doing it I, I would have thought that there's something to do with I, I want to say there's something to do with the crowds but I don't think that's true because early cricket crowds for domestic games were incredible uh, it's a really great question William I'm not sure I can answer that today <laughs> I'll ask Abhishek uh Samba says you've often spoken about the insular nation of Australian cricket. So how was the Cronia Azar match fixing scandal of 2000s covered by the Australian media? Was there any dis dissolution amongst fans? I think there was, I mean, I, I don't, 
I don't think it was seen any differently in Australia than anywhere else in that everyone suddenly realized that um, cricket had changed. You know, I mean, without getting, it's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to compare it to something like September 11 or COVID, but it's a bit like September 11 or COVID for cricket, right? It's when we started thinking very differently about cricket. Um, and ever since you would have to say that that has continued, that we've continued to think in that similar way about cricket, which is, is this game legit? Is that person bad on this game or were they doing it on purpose? All those sorts of things didn't really exist before then. Mind you, I think match fixing, well, match fixing is over 200 years old in cricket. Match fixing is probably as old as cricket. You know, there are stories about WG Grace fixing games. Um, there are, Certainly stories about it happening in county cricket in the 80s and 90s. Um, how much of this is true, I don't know. But it's not that Hansi and, and Azar changed that. But what they did do is I think there was a thought that international cricket was above that. And that changed everything. So I don't think there was anything different in Australia. It was the shocking nature of it. Um, I think a lot of Australians probably thought that um, that would never happen to them. That was probably the thing that they thought which is nonsense. I've had Australian players say that to me before. I did, that's just not true, I don't think. Um, uh, and that's probably part of the Australian exceptionalism. But that's probably the one, one of the big memories I had from the time, but even since then, is that thought of, oh, yeah, but Aussie cricketers wouldn't do that. And they weren't until they caught doing that. AJ says, I remember from the early 2000s that there were many captures taken inside the circle at the point region. Some of the best fielders used to uh, field there uh, with John T and Mohamed Kaif. Uh, has that trend died off since? Um, you don't always put your best fielders at point now for one day or T20 games. I think the way that bowlers bowl is different and the way that players hit boundaries is a little bit different. A big reason why you saw so many catches at point in those days is because you had third man back and you didn't have deep point out. Whereas if you watch one day games now, quite often you will either, in fact, T20 has changed again. T20, we now have a deep backward point on the boundary. So you can't be caught a point. <laughs> You've taken that option away um, from, from you. Um, if you have an offside ring field, having your best fielder at point makes a lot more sense. If players are dropping the ball on the offside and taking singles, um, again, having your best player at point makes a lot more sense. Those are not things that necessarily exist as much in the game anymore. I would still think more often than not on, on the offside, you would have, if, if you're going to have a good fielder in, in the circle, they're going to be you know in that cover area or in that point area. But most of the best fielders now in T20 cricket specifically would be moved out. And in one day cricket again, it's more likely now that you have your more average fielders in the circle. And teams don't tend to tip and run in the same way. They tend to hit the ball to the sweepers a lot more now. So I think that has changed. Um, test cricket, you still usually have your most athletic fielder at point. Not every team does that. And there are specialists in that position. Uh, you know, at point, I would say the best fielders to have a point are usually left-handers because you do get um, you do get people actually drop the ball around that point area and a left hand that can run in, take the ball in their left hand and aim at the three stumps at the bowler's end. Um, it's why, you know, Jadeja uh, was so good at that. Michael Clark was absolutely brilliant at that. It, it took me a long time to work out why Michael Clark had so many run outs. Then I realized that he was coming onto the ball from the right side with a perfect view of the stumps, whereas any right hand out wasn't quite in that position. Um, so, so yeah, I do. I think that was... Um, uh, I think that uh, has been a part of it. You don't get as many catches in the circle now. Um, and I think that's, especially in T20 cricket, the players are trying to hit the ball a lot harder. But also you don't get those, players don't play the chip shots um, or the half shots as much anymore. So generally when you're going for a shot now, you're putting everything into it. Whereas if you watch cricket in the 2090s, there's a lot of steering and guiding um, and chipping of the ball. And that means your ring fielders are a lot more important. Whereas... What we're seeing now is the boundary fielders are a lot more important. 52JS says, can we see Women's Champions League in the coming years? I wouldn't think so because I think the Women's IPL is going to be so big and it's going to have the exact same problem that the cricket did. You know, all the best players are going to qualify um, for about four different teams um, and they're all going to pick the IPL teams and 
kind of what's the point? So I wouldn't have thought so. Pia says, why is the non-striker run out issue so polarizing? It should not be that hard for a batter not to leave the crease. Is there a precedence in other games? Uh, in other games, baseball has a lot of these, as you mentioned. Um, that sport. Trick plays are fetishized in other sports. It's got a long history. And it really doesn't become nasty until the 1950s. And I think that's a really, really interesting period in cricket. 1950s, World War II is finished. England is no longer the force that it once probably thought it was. Uh, you know, America is rising. Uh, you know, Germany almost annihilated, uh, you know, all of Europe or nearly annexed all of Europe. Um, there is a real look back to the good old days of England in English society. It's a very conservative time. And that seems to be when the whole spirit of cricket thing comes about. I mean, that we have gates at Lords, you know, for WG Grace. WG Grace uh, ran out Sammy Jones when Sammy Jones had the, I think the ball hit his pad, rolled out on the leg side. WG Grace picked the ball up. Sammy Jones allegedly looked at him and nodded, went down to this gardening, and WG Grace ran him out. That's far worse than anything. Um, uh, than running out of batter who's out of their crease trying to steal a yard or just being dopey and not noticing they're out of their crease. And I'm not sure why that's an argument. <laughs> it just is. But in those days, those sorts of things were much more common. And, you know, you, you could argue that uh, WG Grace started the ashes by that doing that run out. Like it's a really important hit, run out in the history of cricket. So that that is certainly the fact that Mancad did it twice in a week is really interesting. If you look at the time, Bill O'Reilly said it was fine. Bill Brown, who was run out, said it was fine. Um, I think twice in a week, but twice in a week in the 1950s um, becomes a bit of a global story. And it's very, very early on seen as negative. I do think that um, at that stage, cricketers had less of a negative thought to it. But over generations, the negativity st stays with it until cricketers are really quite negative about it. And we're seeing a new young generation now coming through quite positive. But most cricketers I've ever spoken to, certainly anyone over the age of 28, the vast majority of them hate them. And I think cricket fans are probably, you know, hardcore cricket fans are certainly swinging the other way now. But, uh, you know, I've been pro mancad online for 15 years i can tell you that when i first started it i was in the mono minority <laughs> and now it's getting you much closer to 50 50 um but yeah i do think the negative i think it came from this conservative thing that it wasn't fair play spirit of cricket was really becoming a thing the gentleman sport was really being pushed in that period and these are all nonsense concepts right the, if if a batter plays a shot um uh and, and plays and misses and the wicketkeeper takes the ball and the batter absentmindedly takes half a millimeter step out and he gets run out, um, he's out, right? And this whole thing that there needs to be skill involved, right? Well, okay, so let's say the wicketkeeper didn't take the ball. Let's say the ball hits the batter's pad, it rolls around behind him. He thinks the wicketkeeper's picked it up and thrown it to cover already, hasn't realized he hasn't, takes a step out and the wicketkeeper runs him out. There's no skill in that. The wicketkeeper just picked the ball up on the ground, had it in his hand and he realized someone walked out. But no one would have, to have any issue with that. And I do think that it does come back from this this big the, the big 1950s um, part of it. 1950 is quite a contentious part of cricket. You know, a lot of chucking was going on in cricket at that stage. You had West Indies, India, and then Pakistan, you know, changing the shape of cricket a little bit and perhaps taking it away from England. England, desperate to keep at the amateurism, um, your yeah, amateur side of it alive all those sorts of things so i do think all those little things play a big part in in why we saw that um happen I, i'm actually i'll do a video about it as well but i think me and abhishek um, Mukherjee are going to do a podcast uh, about the history of it it's fascinating history ali says how fundamentally different is women's cricket than men's cricket uh do strategies techniques and tactics differ the, the first thing that used to happen is happening a lot less is that there are a lot more runouts in women's cricket and the reason for that is the circle small, <laughs> very hard to steal singles. Um, that trend, I'd have to talk to John Leather, hyper -cost, Um, But last time I checked with him, with him that seemed to be fading away. Um, uh, that was probably the first major trend I saw in women's cricket. The other one was that if you got on a ground that had big pockets, women could score, a, a good woman batter could score two runs of all really easy. 
Um, Claire Taylor was an absolute master of this. If there were any pockets on the ground, because the throws weren't that strong. That again has disappeared a little bit. Women are throwing twice as fast as they were when I first started watching women's cricket. Uh, that obviously the, the bowling is probably, I would say one of the major differences. Um, the spinners tend to probably roll the ball a little bit more just because they don't have the hand size, even with the smaller ball to be able to get the same kind of revolutions. The pace is slower. Um, generally, gen generally over the last 15 years, it's been a much more skillful game, whereas men's cricket probably became much more power and athlete driven game. Uh, that doesn't seem to be happening as much anymore, uh, within the women's game, uh, but it's a get, it's a sport that you can still dominate as a batter by hitting a lot of boundaries in T20 cricket. Uh, and I mean, sorry, boundaries along the ground, whereas obviously in men's T20 cricket, there aren't, I mean, Prithvi Shaw would be one of the few players on earth that would have, you know, five, five to one boundary ratio. I think he's got a ridiculous high four to six ratio. Most players don't have that anymore. So it's a much more pure game in that point. And, and also when you watch test bowling, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more probably patience and less, um, you know, explosiveness um, required at times. But yeah, I, I, I look at it as it's probably much more similar to like a very, very well-coached club cricket. Whereas I think men's cricket is probably much more like um, really, really hyper athletic gully cricket or backyard cricket, if that makes sense. The, you know, the, there seems to be more freaks in, in men's cricket than there is in women's. And I think that's just part of the way that the professionalism is happening. But the last five years, I would actually say women's cricket has become a lot more like men's cricket, you know, a lot more boundaries being hit. Um, the athleticism in the field is certainly coming up. You know, you can't just get twos by hitting the ball out to the, the sweeper anymore. All those sorts of things are happening. Um, but it is, it is certainly a, um, it is certainly a game where at the moment still, and I don't think this will be the case in five years time, but at the moment still, the women seem to have much more sound techniques at times at that top level than the men do, but they don't have as much improvisation um, as the men do. And that is certainly changing. I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, the women now bowl the wobble ball, for instance. Um, and they, in England, it almost started, you know, it almost spread to women as quickly as it spread to men beforehand, those sorts of changes, like, you know, clearing your front leg and giving yourself room to whack wasn't really a thing that women cricketers did before 2018 at all. Um, whereas, you know, that had been going on in men's cricket since 2010. So it is a, it is different in that perspective as well. Uh, final one, Trion says, will cricket become like football clubs, franchise cricket? Uh, how do you think that will play out? Uh, will they become like football clubs? No, I don't think they'll become like football clubs. Um, because I think there'll always be, um, you know, Manchester is Manchester United, whereas Mumbai Indians is Mumbai, you know, MI Cape Town and MI, I don't know, Philadelphia, Morrisville, Florida, wherever that, you know, uh, wherever that happens. Um, and so I think that is probably the more sustainable franchise model. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to own one team in one league. So I think what you will see is it will be slightly different. It will almost be like an international version of franchise where you will end up in a situation um, separate to what you see in football or basketball or rugby, I suppose, where, you know, you will have one set of owners who will own maybe four or five franchise teams. The only thing that will change with that will be if the IPL ever gets to six, seven, eight, nine months and if that's the case then those other leagues will be more like minor league baseball teams and just feeders but as it's currently set up i think they uh the owners of these leagues do act aren't just seeing them as feeder leagues they, they are seeing them as you know um properties within themselves uh that can that can go on to have success um so it'll be different to football is the probably the most simple way of putting it uh but yes i do believe it will become more franchise based I, i've said this before i wouldn't be overly surprised if one day cricket and even test cricket but certainly test cricket end up with a franchise model as well i think there's too much money going missing at the moment that someone else can work out how to make um i've certainly talked to people who want to make um test cricket into a franchise model on more than one occasion uh so there is that thinking out there so i think we'll go more towards the franchise model so you might have a situation where you have i don't know the 
MI test team um, a, as well. But again, I don't think that's nothing like what we see with the NFL or the NBA or um, uh, the, um, what's the other one? Uh, Premier League football or, or, or European football. So I think it's going to be very, very different. And if you look at it, if you look at what happens with the, I suppose the American owners and now some of the other sporting owners that are coming in from other parts of the world, they generally buy like a baseball team here and a football team here and a cricket team here. I think what you'll see, as I said, will probably be more people buying a cricket team here, a cricket team here, a cricket team here, and a cricket team here, and using all that to create, you know, Mumbai Indians TV and Mumbai Indians um, proper social media platform and, and content management system and all those sorts of things that allow them to comp continually produce content um, for their advertisers and ever and everyone else, which is sort of what the football team's doing. But the football team's doing that with one entity, whereas you know, cricket, you, you know, there'll be different stars maybe in different locations to begin with. But I still believe that eventually the IPL would just be 80% of, of um, you know, the league interest um, from that perspective and will get to be six or eight months long. And at that stage, maybe it does become a little bit more like uh, what you see with um, football where, or with baseball, you own one big team and then you own a bunch of feeder teams. But at the moment, that doesn't seem to be where teams are, are guessing the market is going. Uh, anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we have uh, a lot of great stuff on 99.94, lots of great podcasts coming out. Uh, what have I, have we got the Adam Crossway one about minor league cricket that I just put up on Red Inca. Uh, Double Century this week is about um, uh, the formation of the ICC and why one man um, formed it. Uh, and the race, sort of racial connotations behind how the ICC was formed. Um, what else have we got coming out? I've got a bunch of really good videos, um, one of which is uh, there's one on Owen Morgan coming up very, very soon. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have um, um, – I'm trying to do this big, big series at the moment on uh, on test batting. So hopefully that's only a couple of months away. But then we've got – you know, one on Hawk, the history of Hawkeye coming up um, and a few others. So check out the, the channel. There's some really cool stuff that we've been working on recently. Um, and support 99.94. Go and listen to all the podcasts there. Uh, and uh, thank you all for listening. Remember now you can listen on Facebook, on Twitter, here on YouTube, or on your podcast platform. I'm pretty much everywhere that you need me to be. Anyway, I'll see you again roughly same time next week. There is something wrong in the cricket world, and while it may not be a conspiracy, there does seem to be a movement towards leaving more grass on the wicket, and thusly, the global batting average has dropped. If a similar thing has happened to you in your personal life, try Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 4.0 will help you trim any unwanted pubic grass. And once your downstairs track is taken care of, you can also use Manscaped's liquid formulations. So before heading outside, use the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant to stay cool in the heat. And if you've been playing too many games recently and you need some help with your strip, why don't you go and get their Crop Reviver? I think I may possibly have taken all of this analogy too far. But the point is, Manscaped sells items that allow you to shave your pubic itch pitch. Use the code REDINCA, all one word, which is the name of my podcast, and you can get a 20% discount and free worldwide shipping while you curate your special strip like a team of sweaty men hoping it doesn't rain.